phone to him, or we didn't even have any shields at the time. And, um, and he, Nate Giffen, changed the dynamics on that, 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 in that moment. He approached, he came around, you saw part of a distorted part of the video from Channel 3 that we all saw. And then at this point, I'm now in a, a just resetting a command when shots fired, shots fired from Matt and Isaac calling that in. He came around. He did go down. He did come up. And that was captured on a dash cam video of uh, Corporal Nisley's car, clearly holding the gun in the direction of where Corporal Nisley and Inspector Welch were standing when our officer shot He was already shot shot him again, that one shot, and then it stopped the threat, the immediate threat. Um, it, did, it is a horrible thing to see, it's a horrible thing to be part of, and also the pouncing on him so there's no opportunity to grab anything else or whatever. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if there's another gun or a waistband or what have you. Later there was also a getaway driver, um, and who was later arrested. Uh, so my point on that one, that's what they, what the, um, Suicide.org would refer to it as a spontane uh, spontaneous suicide. The plan was to rob a bank that day. Um, and so we looked at, so now in our department, we have shields in every one of our cars. Because if we had to make an approach, we could do it safe. There was no safe way to do that approach. I also did not, by giving the command to not approach, was not to precipitate something on our end. He's staying there, we've got communication with one person, our negotiator, let's just keep going. He did not give us the opportunity. He did not surrender. And I know, I, you know, I'm on ski patrol with Jim Giffen, and this was very hard. Thank you. I did, and you know, just to follow up on your statement that there haven't been any just unjustified, you know, under the ground of our area. Where or the wood would shoot new people in the church at the time. And according to them, <clears throat> there was never a time that anyone else except Woody threatened himself. So, um, you know, Attorney General justified it, but it was a, it was a difficult situation. And, uh, hard for people to, to take that in. Appreciate hearing how the recognition. People in, in crisis right now. There's a greater recognition and awareness of how they're treated. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, having me here today. Um, I believe I've submitted some prepared testimony uh, specifically on H-808, but I'll speak quickly to H-464 at the end as well. Uh, I just got some notes, okay. so you can just yep. leave it up. And uh, I think there's at least one slide that's just referenced in there that I'll kind of show you a visual so you can see as well. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, to come before you today to speak about these two big pieces of legislation. Uh, in short, the ACLU of Vermont supports uh, both pieces of legislation. Uh, I'll speak to H808 first. So um, H808 would create a statutory standard for the use of deadly force in Vermont. And Vermont currently lacks a statutory standard. Um, well, at the same time, we do have a statutory standard for the use of less deadly force in the form of tasers. Um, and so we would support instituting a statewide standard that says that it um, that requires an officer to use um, deadly force only when it is necessary. So this would be the necessary standard. This is, as you know, recently adopted by the state of California. Um, and the necessary standard, standard established in the ADA requires officers to use other techniques and resources other than deadly force when reasonably safe uh, and feasible to do so. Then also the bill also determines uh, that the 
propriety of deadly force uh, can be used when decisions, and when, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> misread a sentence. <laughs> so the bill requires that when determining the propriety of the use of deadly force, decision makers must consider the conduct leading up to the use of force. Um, and so this is, bill is especially timely right now just because we've seen a, a consistent rise in the number of officer-involved shootings per year. So this is referenced in my testimony, but this is just a very simple graph. This is compiled by the Vermont State Police. It shows officer-involved shootings um, between um, both of, with the Vermont State Police and other state departments. So you'll see it's a pretty standard linear progression increasing over, over the last couple of years. Um, there's been, I think, nearly as many shootings in the last decade as there are in the previous three decades. And if you look at 19, uh, 2019 compared to 1999, there's, there's a fourfold thing. So we have been seeing an increase in officer-involved shootings um, and think that this would be a time to create a statewide standard for consistency. Um, so another reason that this is something that um, we believe it would be helpful is, is the number of folks that interact, that are most often involved in these type of incidents are often people who have diminished capacity in some way. So it's individual, as Bill says, individuals with physical, mental health, developmental, intellectual disabilities um, are significantly more likely uh, to be involved in these incidents as their disabilities may affect their ability to understand or comply with commands from law enforcement and officers. And um, the de adoption of a necessary standard could help address this disparity by prioritizing the use of de-escalation tactics. And I think this is one place that, as we've listened to the testimony, uh, this is a place where there's agreement between the ACLU and law enforcement. We've heard from them many times that they are prioritizing de-escalation tactics. Um, this is something they say they use in their training, and we think that this bill codifies those values. Um, Importantly, the requirement that the force be necessary means that if de-escalation is possible, deadly force is not necessary. Uh, it requires decision makers to examine whether the officers uh, escalated situations in the empty use of force or failed to de-escalate it when it could have been reasonable to do so. Um, so also another important aspect of H-808 is that it creates a definition of imminent threat and that it's not merely a fear of future harm but is one that from appearances must be instantly confronted and addressed. So we think this creates some clear statutory standards which don't exist at this point in time, um, and we would support adopting this into law. Um, and then when it comes to H-464, um, we, we are very supportive of better data collection around the use of force. Um, generally, the, the lack of data collection in the criminal justice system is something that is a, a very large problem that we've been trying to speak quite a bit about. I will say that it, I, actually law enforcement is providing probably some of the, the more comprehensive data um, around these things now, so in terms of police stops and other pieces of information, but I think this is one more piece of information that would be helpful to have. Um, and as 464 speaks to um, the process of uh, uh, creating more training uh, and programming in collaboration with other stakeholders. We think that that collaborative approach is something that could be helpful. It, it sounds like something like you were, descri uh, you were describing in your comments earlier um, and think that that could be helpful to get those different perspectives. So we would support that legislation. So that is our, our testimony today and I'd be happy to take any questions. I've heard the reference to this California model just implemented. Yep. Why would we point to that as an example of success when there's no data? <laughs> we have absolutely no idea how it's going to turn out. It, it could, couldn't it wind up worse than what we've been dealing with? Well, we think that bill says, and we think that this bill says, that deadly force would only be used when necessary. And that's why we're supportive of it. And you know, that is a bill that has passed. I believe you know, law enforcement originally objected to it. They withdrew their objection. They didn't full-throatedly support it. They understand there's a difference, and I think working in this building, you all understand there's there's difference between that. And uh, uh, But it is one that it says deadly force was only going to be used when necessary, and we support that. So is it the ACAU's position now that deadly force has been used when it wasn't justified? Well, I, I think, as you heard, that under the current standards, that there are times that you know, we have not seen any of these shootings been um, declared unjustified. But going forward, we're looking prospectively. You know, this is what this legislation will do. It's not going to go relitigate anything that happened in the past. 
is going to say prospectively, this is the standard we'd like to see used when officers are deciding to use deadly force. <laughs> I'm trying to restrain myself, but you gave me an opening. <laughs> so. I did. I can also go to Marsha. <laughs> it's just so unusual that you're not first out of the game. Okay. It's Friday. Um, thank you for your testimony. One of the things on 808 in the California language that was real clear to me was from law enforcement's testimony the other day was words matter. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a law enforcement official. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. I'm a legislator, so I get to, I get to help. Um, what? Why is law enforcement, I mean, it was not, it was very clear that words matter. I mean, I heard that from the commissioner, I heard that from the hallways afterwards, and I heard it from the training um, the deputy director, or whatever, uh, Drew at uh, the police academy. I mean, it was very clear. What changes with the California, why is this the, new model we should embrace? Well, I mean, one, I will 100% agree that words matter. I think that is something that uh, probably everyone here holds very, very dear. And when looking at this, one, I'll say we, we don't have a statutory standard right now. So those words are not on paper in statute. And in terms of those words, we believe that necessary is the correct standard. And I think that's something that people can agree on. And by doing that, implementing that standard, it does prioritize the use of de-escalation in these interactions, and that is something that we're not saying that law enforcement is not doing, but it sets that standard in statute. Stephen Whitaker from Montpelier. Um, I want to call to your attention an overlap. I'm specifically speaking um, in memory of Mark Johnson, which is the most recent shooting in Montpelier that you heard about. We have had no shootings, and we have two shootings in as many years, and both of which involve a mentally uh, distressed individual both of which involved uh, what appeared to be a dangerous firearm. Um, so I think we need to be very careful in recognizing that justified is a uh, term subject to interpretation. I would encourage y'all to look at, watch the video, as disturbing as it is, watch the video of the Mark Johnson shooting last August. Um, here's a mentally distressed person who had locked himself out of his own building, trying to get back in with a knife, allegedly. I haven't, um, there are some public records overlaps that I'll speak to here. Um, I've not seen all the records that are, I need to see on this. Um, he flees, he's apprehended or, uh, challenged on the bridge by the only two officers in cruiser on. He attempts to, twice to jump into the river from either the south side of the Spring Street Bridge or the north side of the Spring Street Bridge. Instead of allowing him to jump into the river, he might have broken a leg, he might have gotten a little water in his lungs, he would not be dead. So instead, our officer orders him down repeatedly, you know, and ends up putting two <coughs> fragmentation rounds in him because we didn't have the 12 gauge being back shotgun in that cruiser. If you've only got one cruiser on the road, maybe that should be the one with the ping back shotgun in it. You know? We could have waited. This this was a this it appears to me, and I'm not an expert on psychiatry, but this appears to be an intentional suicide by cop, 
a very distressed individual waving a toy pistol or a pellet pistol. There, the individual was known to the police department prior. There may, he may, the police department might have known that he had a pellet pistol. <coughs> So there's a lot of <coughs> ambiguities here that would have warranted to wait, move slow, de-escalate. And instead we had two fragmentation rounds into his abdomen from a rifle. Um, you listen to the audio on the tape, you realize that these people realize he couldn't hit the side of a barn from 20 yards. He was that distressed and, and just waving a, a pellet pistol in the air. So this, the idea that this couldn't have waited on a mental health professional or waited on a backup cruiser with the beanbag shotgun uh, or, for, you know, last resort take, hit him in the leg, you know? But to basically kill someone unnecessarily who's facing a mental distress, intending to get shot, possibly, is, is unwarranted. Now there's a public records issue here and that I would ask the committee to consider clarifying that the independent investigation that would have been done by the Vermont State Police was undermined by a decision of our chief, and I, and I do respect our chief, I see he's in a tough spot here. Uh, at the end of his career I want him to, you know, have all due respect. But, there was a decision in the Burlington case where the, a judge ruled that the officer had the right to review the video before giving his statement. Um, that needs to be clarified because the state police clear, warned the police department here, do not let him review that video before we get his statement or even do a deposition. I'm not, sure, I, I'm not part, privy to those communications. but. Our chief overruled that and let him watch the video before he gave his statement. <coughs> so, in effect, we subverted what would have been an independent investigation by the state police and would have done a lot to restore public confidence in this. Since then, our city council has offered to hold a public forum and instead put five minutes on a number seven on an agenda and swept it under the rug. But pending public records requests for the affidavit that the state's attorney requested. The state's attorney requested an affidavit from the chief. It's been months and that still hasn't been produced. Our city council, mayor, city manager, ignores appeals to the head of the agency on the public records appeal on this issue. So we have a problem in the accountability, the transparency, and the undermining of public confidence. So. But the issue of whether or not a video of an incident should be withheld pending an investigation from the shooter uh, is clearly a public records issue that needs clarification, uh, possibly to avoid this ambiguity where a, an independent investigation could be undermined. Yeah, the interpretation of a violent felony and, you know, when you've got a, a resident of a sub subsidized housing, Montpelier Housing Authority, you know, trying to jimmy into a building that he lives in, it's hard to characterize. It may have been mischaracterized as a violent felony in progress. Um, so I would argue we don't have good policy. I would support the bill requiring good policy be adopted. I would encourage you to clarify the ability to uh, ref restrain viewing of the video until the statements are made by an independent investigator. It turns out the officer who did kill Mark Johnson um, unnecessarily, in my opinion, uh, had prior uh, in an incident of a teenager smoking pot, broken a woman's ribs. 
uh, and then in a separate incident, a distressed, mentally distressed person uh, snapped a guy's arm who was holding on to his wife, who clearly understood and communicated that he was distressed. The man died as a result. So this is the third incident with this particular officer that uh, should give us all pause. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be on the record uh, in support of uh, a request from the Vermont uh, Criminal Justice Training Council and the Vermont Police Academy. That was underway well before any bills were introduced here. Um, there is a, uh, a lot of, well, I think it's pretty universal support by all law enforcement that we expand the basic training an additional four weeks. Um, and I think you'll hear from Rick Gothier, I, I hope you do, who will come in and sort of explain that to you a little bit more in depth. You heard a little bit of it in that first hearing. Uh, and we would support whatever this committee can do and this legislative body can do to support that appropriation. Uh, and the second piece is he, the academy is also going to be, the Criminal Justice Training Council will also be asking <coughs> to uh, expand the reporting requirements under Act 56, which I think was passed 2017, 2017, I think, maybe, or 2018. It requires that all law enforcement report to the Criminal Justice Training Council uh, categories of misconduct. And I think conduct B is a second report of unlawful force, and my guess is, or use of force, not unlawful force. And uh, I. Uh, law enforcement supports actually the expansion of that. Again, something that they all um, agreed upon well before any legislation came before this body. So we would ask that this committee support that change. We think it's a good idea. So I wanted to get those two things on the record. And, uh, and also as you pay attention to the requests for the resources of the folks who are dealing with these community issues, uh, telling what they need to have better outcomes. There's a difference between Chittenden County and the ability to share full resources when you're nearby, Richmond, near to Williston, near to Burlington, then in some of our more rural communities. Uh, so I think it's worth paying attention to the uh, disparate level of resources available to everybody. And lastly, I, I just want to follow up um, on some of the testimony around some use of force cases, including the Woody case. It was actually general counsel of public safety, and they did the investigation into that case. Um, you know, no one in law enforcement jumps to a conclusion that use of force is justified and shouldn't until you've completed an investigation because you can't properly make that determination until you undertake a real investigation, you take a look at all of it, and you finish it. And then you have to look at it using what is the Vermont standard and has been the Vermont standard. We are not standardless in the state. We operate under Graham v. Connor. And the interesting thing about California, and I'll just note that, I'm not ready to get into California with you now, but the interesting thing about California, their problem was that they actually had a statutory standard. It was outdated, it was unconstitutional. So the problem with Modifying what you think is the standard today. So this is a really comes from the Constitution. And the courts interpret it, and you'll, um, I'm sure Representative Gannon will, will assist you with this, but you know, courts are always examining this. Here in the Second Circuit, it's under examination, and <coughs> we are re responding to that. That information is in real time to law enforcement. And then they make changes and they update their training, and the bulletin goes out. and. Uh, if the standard or some interpretation uh, gives them some guidance, they act on it. So I just want you to, to keep that in mind. California had a, um, a unique reason for undertaking its effort. And the last piece of that puzzle is, yeah, law enforcement did object to it, uh, but they were in a legislative process. And as you all know, when you're in a legislative process, sometimes you have to get to a point in the process where you get something and you have to give something. That uh, support did not come at the beginning of the process. Um, it came after there was some back and forth and they were able to secure some language that made them feel a little bit more comfortable. But I don't think it was the whole uh, ask. So I just want to keep that in mind. 
And that's about as much as I wanted to share on that. Hopefully we can continue that conversation later. So quickly, on your first part of your testimony, you talked about the collection of information. Were you referring to the type of force employed uh, that's in 464 um, that goes to the, um, the data collection? We support that. I, 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 I advise the chair and I should put that on the record as well. There's no objection from law enforcement to fully support um, that data collection piece. So if you want to add that, that's fine. Okay, where are you in the second part? Of the video? We actually um, have not, I have not looked at the rest of it because. This is on a new model policy and yeah. additional four hours of training. I, I think that uh, we actually have uh, post basic. I think Drew touched upon this. We have post basic use of force training that is mandatory for all the law enforcement. That's an additional block that they have to have that's already happening. But uh, we, uh, the organization, and I think Tony touched upon it, the position of the Vermont Police Association, uh, and I believe it was the testimony of uh, Commissioner Sherling, and I believe uh, that's what you heard from Drew Bloom is the use of force training dis uh, director that it is not a good idea to legislate policy because policy is a living and breathing document. Um, that is, uh, that is their, their, their position. So at this time, not supporting. Uh, that piece of information about California actually comes off of their website. It is the uh, uh, so you can make that bigger. <laughs> Apparently, they have, a pro they have a process where they put information on the record in, in the Senate, Senate Public Safety Committee's report on the bill. They cite some history and specifically speak to um, the uh, codification of what they perceive to be an outdated and unconstitutional um, use of force law. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.